On the 12th of May, 1996, Stephen Cole, Chili Jenkins, Ray McKenna, and Police Grass, Paul Johansson, in brackets, Johansson stood in the witness box and testified against Darren O'Flaherty, who was jailed for five years for wounding him, close brackets, ran into Brubaker's social club, Kirby, and attacked doorman John Dillon. Dillon was stabbed about the body and in the arms and legs. This, police believe, was a catalyst that led to the hacking to death of Kirby Bullyboy, an all-round bad guy, Stephen Cole. John Dillon had been working at Brubaker's that night with several other doormen who, according to Dillon, could have done more to help him when the attack took place. Bad blood had developed between Cole, Jenkins and John Dillon following the acquittal of Stephen Cole over the shooting of Tommy Cross. Cole had blasted Cross in the face with a 9mm handgun outside the Chaser Public House on 20th of August 1994. He was cleared of attempted murder on the 8th of August 1995. The scene was now set for a major showdown between f rival fractions. Factions. Stephen Cole was a well-known hard case in and around Kirby, not someone you wanted trouble with. Even though he was a bully and generally disliked, he could have a fight. Cole was from a coloured family that lived in Kirby. Things could not have been easy for families like this, grown up in Kirby, Liverpool's overspill in the 1960s, when racism was more prevalent than it than at present. All the same, the Coles, like other coloured families in Kirby, got on with it and fit in as best they could. In fact, Cole was a keen footballer who played for Liverpool reserves between 1978 and 1982 and had continued to play for local clubs. As time moved on into the 1990s, Cole got involved with the club door scene in and around Merseyside with close friend Chili Jenkins. Jenkins had worked on the Quadrant Park for Jed Starkey in 1991 and 1992, as had John Dillon. Cole and Jenkins were now working on the Cream Dance Club, right next door to the Club Continental, where John Dillon worked. Dillon worked for the Bennetts, who ran the Conti Door. After the stabbing of John Dillon at Brubaker's, there were several standoffs between Cole and his mob and Dillon and Co. at the Cream Conti Doors on 18th of May. 1996, police had to intervene as Cole and Jenkins shouted abuse at John Dillon whilst working at the Conti. Dillon had a fair-sized firm behind him that were more than a match for whatever Cole Jenkins could muster. He was not about to back down from Cole and his associates. The next morning, Sunday 19th of May, police visited John Dillon and informed him that they had received an anonymous phone call stating that Stephen Cole was about to shoot him. According to the police, John Dillon organised a call out of Dorman, some 30 strong, to go looking for Cole. Police patrols in Kirby saw large groups of men meeting at Gino's Wine Bar in Cherryfield Drive, Kirby. At 9.15pm, a convoy of Dorman began its run into Liverpool in a hunt for Cole. In the next 15 minutes, they stopped outside the Coppel House pub and Chasers, both on Longmore Lane. The police car, way out of its area, radio details of the 11 car combi and turned back to Kirby. At 9.30 p.m. a mob between 20 and 30 strong burst into the Farmer's Arms public house and attacked Stephen Cole. Cole was with his wife having a drink when he was smashed over the head with a baseball bat and a hat with knives and a machete, suffering horrific wounds. At 10.20 p.m. Stephen Cole was pronounced dead. A massive police hunt is now underway for the mob that murdered Stephen Cole, with all eyes pointing towards John Dillon. The spotlight now turned on John Dillon. Police had uncovered the fact that on the day of the murder, John Dillon had made roughly 60 phone calls from his house to various doormen, friends and associates. The police believed John was organising the call-out that was later to hunt down and kill Stephen Cole. Police now set their sights on those John had called, Wayne McLean, Andrew Blakey Blakemore and all the Bennets were next to be dragged in by the police. In addition, due to the wide awake copy who had taken down car number plates, the murder squad started rounding up other suspects. These were Jimmy, Jeannie Cook and Ian Archer. Once the police had all these in custody, they set about questioning them about their whereabouts on the day of the murder. Those John Dillon had phoned had not committed an offence because someone had called them, neither had those police believed were in a convoy of cars on the way to commit a murder. The police are the ones who have to prove things, 
not the other way around. What the police do did was to get everyone in, then try to break whatever alibis they may have. Then they tried to place them at the scene of the crime. A phone call or a car being in a convoy doesn't prove you murdered anyone. All those arrested were bail pending further inquiries. Several weeks passed and all those arrested thought that would be the end of it, with some even going on holiday. Then something unexpected happened. A girl called Joanne Clark made a statement to the police that she was drinking in Gino's wine bar when she saw John and Paul Dillon, the Bennetts, Wayne McLean, Tony Stapleton and Andrew Blakey Blakemore. With this, new witnesses came forward. All were rearrested and charged with conspiracy to cause grievous bodily harm. Now, why Joanne Clark did this still remains unclear. She was at one time the girlfriend of Paul Dillon and was at least on friendly terms with those she then accused. A car spotted in the convoy was registered to an Ian Archer, but Archer had sold the car to Ray Navarro. On arrest, Archer informed the police that he had sold the car to Ray Navarro, with Ray being subsequently arrested. Ray hadn't sent the logbook off to be changed, so the car remained in Archer's name. This put Archer in a very awkward position. But if he had an alibi for that night and maintained he had sold the car to a person or persons unknown, he could have got out of this tight corner. He didn't have an alibi, panicked and threw Ray to the police. Remember, this was a murder investigation and someone without insider knowledge of how the system works can't be blamed for losing that bottle. Ray was charged with conspiracy to cause grievous bodily harm and remanded in custody with all the others. John and Paul Dillon, Wayne McLean, Ray Navarro, Tony Stapleton, Andrew Blakey Blakemore and Jimmy Jeannie Cook were now all remanded in Walton Jail on conspiracy charges. Facing the same charges with the Bennett brothers, Tommy, Wayne, Joey and Jason, John Riley and Evil Roy were on murder charges. Things weren't too bad for the lads in Walton as they knew one or two screws that came into the clubs they worked in. These made sure the lads were looked after and always got access to the gym. I myself had heard no more from the police regarding the allegations against me and haven't up to the present day. The lads in Walton hadn't been in there very long when Riley and Evil Roy got bail on the murder. This was due to their not being served legal papers within the prescribed limits set by the law. They were automatically given bail, which then paved the way for the rest of the lads to apply to a judge in chambers and got released on bail also. All those released had conditional bail, the condition being they had to reside outside of Liverpool. Wayne McLean was bailed to an old friend's house in Birmingham, while John Dillon, Ray Navarro and Jimmy Cook were bailed to Denby. This was the home of ex-Kirby man John Brodie. Brodie was living in a farmhouse and tended to a pack of hounds belonging to the local hunt. John Brodie is a good man, always there for his friends whenever they need him. The trial date was set for November 1997 at Preston Crown Court. I was at this time in Strangeways Jail on charges of threatening to kill Tommy Wynn. I hadn't yet been charged with George Bromley's murder. On the day of the trial, there was a lot of legal wrangling as well as plea bargaining. Their case against some of the lads was very weak, and Joanne Clark had been more or less discredited as a liar and a crank. This cook who was a manic depressive and had been on all types of medication. The Crown knew they couldn't rely on her evidence, with even the judge rebuking her. With this, the prosecution decided not to call her, but then were left with a very weak case against several of the lads. The prosecution dropped some of the charges to violent disorder, with the possibility of two to four years on a guilty plea. Blakey, the genie, John and Paul Dillon accepted this, while Wayne McLean didn't. Wayne was about to until the excellent John Brown intervened, telling Wayne to hang on a little bit longer. John Dillon was sentenced to four years. Paul Dillon, Paul Dillon three years. Jimmy Cook got 18 months, but that was later reduced to nine months, and Andrew Blakemore received three years. Due to John Brown's skillful manoeuvring, charges were dropped on Wayne McLean and Tony Stapleton. Ray Navar Navarro, had been offered the same deal as Dylan and co, but held out in the belief that Ian Archer wouldn't be turning up to give evidence against him. Sadly, Archer did turn up and gave evidence against Ray. Ray was convicted and sentenced to 10 years imprisonment. On 5th of December 1998, John Riley and Robert Evil Roy McCarthy were found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment. Afterwards, the Elfish Detective Superintendent Russ Walsh, who led the inquiry, described the case as barbaric slaughter. He said, we will not tolerate the gratuitous use of violence by any members of the public and will diligently pursue anyone who resorts to this type of behaviour. Detective Superintendent Walsh praised Mrs. Cole for her strength and dignity, saying he hoped she and her two daughters will be able to rebuild their lives. 
The police came under criticism from the judge for not preventing the murder in the first place. Had the police continued to follow the mob and not turned back when supposedly out of their area, this murder may not have ever happened. Okay, that was two separate extracts from Joey Owens' book, Pain and Plenty of It, which chronicles the door wars and his experience on the doors in Liverpool through the 80s and 90s. Now, that was a particularly brutal murder of Stephen Cole. Two got lifed off, as Joey said, and a number of them got relatively low sentences. Um, John Dillon, who was one of the key members of the door firm that was rowing with Stephen Cole's and Chili's um, crew of door firms, he, who got stabbed up, etc., and that's why the, the the revenge attack was made, he ended up quite recently, I think, maybe a few years ago, getting caught up in the Encro chat um, situation and got got a big jail um, for allegedly being a, a big drug dealer, etc. But this was sort of mid-90s. I don't know if anyone remembers. I certainly do. Around about that time, going to Cream um, on the clubbing circuit, we used to always go clubbing, whether it be Golden, Cream. We'd have like Shelley's and um, Golden and places like that in Stoke-on-Trent as well, where I'm from. Um, but there's a big, there's a big scene, you know, in Liverpool, Stafford, Swoon, um, all over the place, London. But in Liverpool, the Continental and Cream, the Super Club, they were having beef the two door firms, and that's how it all kicked off. And it just shows that something over nothing really kicks off. John Dillon got stabbed up. Loads of bad threats going around saying they were going to do this, do that. Police had warned him on the morning of the death of um, Stephen Cole that John Dillon was life was in danger from Stephen Cole. So there was a lot that went into this. I've got quite a lot of news reports. But leading up to Christmas, I am mad busy with my main work that I do, my business, etc. So I'm with obviously family commitments. So I'm going to try and get a couple of videos out a week over Christmas. But one will probably be like audio based like this with just a few images. And I will try and get one good documentary. Oh, I'm, I'm trying some new software that's been recommended to me um, to make the videos even better. But obviously it all takes time. So just bear with me, guys. But I will try and get a couple of uploads, whether it be audio or proper documentaries. Um, okay, have a great evening.